I was very glad that uh, Dr. Mateula spoke about uh, history and symbols and Paul Kruger and St. Petersburg. You know, Dr. Mateula, if you go to St. Petersburg, if you fly into the city, the, uh, there's a new terminal. And on the terminal, they've got St. Petersburg. Next to it, there's an old terminal, which is still used. On that terminal, they've got Leningrad. And in the center of the city, uh, is to this day, you'll find a big statue of Lenin. And somebody told me, I think this is correct, I can't vouch for it, that St. Petersburg is in the district of Leningrad. Like Pretoria is in the district of Tswan. I'm saying I'm very glad you said all of these things that you said quite correctly, that St. Petersburg became Leningrad and Leningrad became St. Petersburg. Because I think it says something to us about how we should handle our own history. And you're quite, quite correct, Dr. Matewula, about this. Because there's a, a conflict. Sometimes we think that today will forever be today. Not, not remembering that today will be tomorrow. And tomorrow will be different from today. And all of this wealth uh, one of our quarrels, not quarrels, the differences with our colleagues in South Sudan is that they decided uh, at independence that uh, they would have English as, as an official language and prohibit uh, and not Arabic. And so forget this Arabic. And so when you discuss this thing with them, we say, but why? They say, no, 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 because uh, this is for us as South Sudanese. This is a colonial language, Arabic. So we say, don't what about English? Uh, is it not a colonial language? Well, now it, that becomes a bit difficult. Now, of course, the problem with it, <coughs> with that decision, you remember that uh, South Sudan got its independence, celebrated its independence in July 2011. So we attended the ceremony, uh, and thousands and thousands of people naturally there to celebrate this independence. And the leadership of South Sudan addressed those masses in Arabic. So we're saying to them, but how do you do that? Here yeah, the people have gained the use of a language. Now you want to scrape this language out of their heads. You can't do that. Yeah. But still, it's again uh, today. So today we are liberated from the north which is Arabic, uh, Arab speaking, so we abandon the language, but no doubt tomorrow uh, they will find that even among themselves as South Sudanese, this Arabic which officially is not part of them, is actually a lingua, lingua franca in South Sudan. Uh, so I'm saying it, Dr. Mantebula, thanks a lot for that example. And I really hope it does say uh, something to all of us about how we should handle this very contentious issue of uh, symbols in this country, culture. Uh, Paul Kruger must fall, and uh, you know all of that. Uh, at the union building here, when uh, I used to be there, I don't know what the situation is now. Um, when you entered through the back, uh, on, from the driving on the western side of the building, you have uh, 
what is called the Smarts Lawn. And it's got a bust of Jan Smarts there. And as I say, it's called the Smarts Lawn. And you come into the building, as you come into the building, there's a small alcove. And in that alcove is a bust of Jan van Riebeck. Uh, so, so I told this story to some lady some time back. And so she says, no, but how could you do that? How could you leave those things there? So I say, no, but why not? No, 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 no. I mean, those people are bad. Jan van Riebeck, Jan Smarts. So I said to her, well, they are part of our history. Why don't we build, if, if we've got, we have created our own history, we've got our own heroes and heroines, why don't we build our own statues in addition? Instead of saying, remove these and, uh, yeah. Because indeed, if you look at South Africa today, uh, Professor Mamuchi, as indeed you are saying, we, South Africa, we can't deny this reality that even South Africa of today is made up partly of its past. And you can't say that by removing Paul Kruger, you've therefore removed that past you haven't. It's a pretense. It's a show. And in some instances leads to failure to attend to the real challenges. Because you think the symbol is gone, therefore the substance has gone, and substance hasn't gone. But anyway... <laughs> No, I'm supposed to talk about Adwa, not about St. Petersburg. <laughs> no, but uh, let me say thank you very much indeed to everybody for doing everything that you've done here on, on Africa Day. Uh, I think it's very, very important that all of us should indeed take ownership of this day, May 25, as a collective common part of our common heritage as Africans. And, and utilize it uh, in the way that uh, Professor Schobier here has done to say what is it, what are the tasks we face. It's not just so that we celebrate and uh, have a bit of mkombo tea and, and so on to say we're celebrating Africa Day, but to say wh what is it, what we, what's happened during the last year on our continent? What are the tasks that we face? What are the challenges? What do we do? And so I'm really very, very glad indeed that uh, you took uh, the trouble to, 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 to observe this, this, this Africa Day. And, and, to, and to celebrate, uh, commemorate the 120th anniversary of the Battle of Adwa. Uh, I'm very glad about the points that Professor Mamamuchi men mentioned, including about education. Uh, two, three years ago, there was a young lady, uh, well, I suppose it must be a lady, but she was in uh, grade 10, grade 11 at school, um, high school student, came with two others, another young lady and a young man. They came to see us at our foundation. Um, so fine, we, we meet them, 15, 16 year old. And they say, no, the reason we wanted to see you is because we are very, very concerned about uh, what we're learning at school. And they said, uh, what we learn at school is that as Africans, we've always been victims. They say that, look, we were victims of slavery, then we became victims of colonialism, then we became victims of apartheid, and even today, we remain victims of circumstances. And uh, so they said that the problem with this now, these are really young people, and then they say to us that, see if we, even, even us, we can see that there are some things that are not right here at home about South Africa. And would really like to do something 
to help to change this. But we're discouraged, we're demotivated. And the reason we are demotivated is because we are told that we are always victims. So there is nothing that is constructive or good that is going to come out of us, even if we try to change these bad things that we see. We can't succeed because we are always victims. So they said now, please President, does this mean that there was never anything that these Africans who ever did? Contributed nothing just a, always a victim of other people. Uh, so we said, no, no of course not. Uh, so what are you going to do? Now this was your mission. So what are you going to do about this education we're getting at school? Huh? I said, but I'm not Minister of Education. Uh, no, 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 no. You must, you must do something about it. Very interesting when they had a lot of interaction. They brought the later other schools um, to grapple with this. Now, it's, I'm saying it's, it's an important, it was an important issue that they raised, which remains with us. Uh, I'll come back to this thing just now. There's an old man uh, who's late now, unfortunately. Uh, uh, some of us might have heard of him. Uh, Lawrence van der Post died in London uh, some years back. Uh, at the time when we were mobilizing people to uh, support the struggle for liberation, yeah, we, we saw him, uh, Lawrence van der Post, in London with our former Deputy Minister, Aziz Bahant. And he told us a very interesting story. And he said when uh, he attended school, some school, uh, during his schooling years uh, in Natal, in what was Natal, and he played hockey, school hockey. Then one year they, there was a school's competition here in Pretoria, uh, and he came to lead his team. Uh, now he says that uh, he comes from the Free State originally, born there. So he says, being at school in Natal then, the problem, he said, one of the problems there was that they didn't have cook sisters in Natal because these are English speaking people. They had no cook sisters. So he says, now being in Pretoria, this was one of my great ambitions to have a cook sister. So when they were not playing, he went to a restaurant here in Pretoria, <laughs> midday. <coughs> And he says, so he got there and he ordered his cook sisters and so on. And it was him and a woman who was serving. Uh, white, white uh, uh, restaurant as, as the situation was then. And he says as he was, uh, he had his back to the counter. Then uh, he had some people coming in but didn't look. And until a commotion started. So he turned and then and, and looked. And he says there were two Chinese looking men who were wearing khaki dust coats. And this white woman was refusing to serve them. And so he says, no, he took offense to this. So he speaks to her, and they speak in Africans, and says, no, but can't you see these are visitors? How can you say yeah, you can't serve them? So indeed, they, they got served. And uh, then they thank him and so on, and uh, everybody goes away. Then he says, uh, some many months later, uh, he goes to his back in Durban. He gets a letter, a ship, a ship docks in, K in, uh, in Durban. And he gets a letter from the captain of the ship. And the captain of the ship says, please, can you come? Uh, I'd like to see you. So Lawrence van der Post says, indeed, he went on board the ship. And uh, this is a Japanese ship. And this man says, uh, you know, thank you very much, welcome. And uh, I have what I've, uh, the reason I want to see you because I've got a letter for you from the foreign minister of Japan. Uh -uh. 
So indeed he has this letter and the letter invites him to come to Japan. So he says to us that he then the captain of the ship then explains to him that no you see the day there was that incident in Pretoria those two people were Japanese and when they came back they reported what had happened uh, so the foreign minister of Japan would like you to come to Tokyo so that we can say thank you very much indeed so he says it, did, it went stayed in Japan for a few months learned a bit of Japanese in the process. Now, he says, you know, I'm a young man, I'm still at school, uh, but anyway, it was nice to be a guest of the uh, Emperor of Japan. He treated me very well, learned his bit of Japanese, and the reason uh, they wanted me to come is because they wanted advice. And the advice was, the Japanese wanted a colony in Africa. They get this young fellow to say, now look, uh, please advise us. Where can we get this colony? Uh, so Lawrence van der Poel says that, and they were very, very interested in Ethiopia. Because they've looked in the map, they said, you see, but as we can see, this one, there's nobody who owns them. Uh, we so he says that, you know, he himself, uh, he must now play very knowledgeable about the continent. Yes, indeed, you're quite right. This one. Now, this is before the, before the Italians came. Uh, this one is, uh, is, is ready for the taking. And uh, <coughs> then, uh, in the end, he goes home. He ends up in the British Army around uh, the Second World War. And ultimately, uh, when, the Jap when they had to drive the Japanese out of Indonesia, he ended up there in Indonesia. Um, so they're fighting the Japanese. And then he says, uh, one day they are uh, in their camp with his uh, Indonesian guerrillas fighting for the independence of Indonesia. And they wake up and they are surrounded by the Japanese army. Uh, so he was commanding this group. So he says, then the uh, Japanese commander comes and he stands up and he salutes. And he says there are nine degrees of respect in the Japanese language. And because he had learned a bit of Japanese, he used the ninth grade, the highest grade of respect for this Japanese officer, who was taken aback because he's a white man. He just dressing me like this. And of course, they get captured, and he says as a result, they, they were well treated as prisoners of war by the Japanese. Now, <coughs> he thought maybe even this commander had got the information that he had advised that they must take Ethiopia. Uh, now, uh, Professor Muchi, this is part of the price that the Ethiopians had to pay for the liberation for the defeat of the Japanese at Andro. Now, I hope all of us know what I'm talking about. The Battle of Andro. No. And this battle was fought in 1896. At the end of uh, uh, February, uh, 1896. Uh, the Italians, coming out of the Berlin Conference, which you remember 1884-85, which then allocated, divided countries, African countries, and, and colonized, but not Ethiopia. The Italians uh, thought 
they want this Ethiopia. Uh, and a lot of maneuvers uh, to achieve that objective. And by this time, they had occupied uh, what is Eritrea uh, today, uh, or parts of it. Um, and from there, wanted to expand and take over Ethiopia as a whole. Now, of course, Ethiopia then is a feudal country. Um, the emperor of, of Ethiopia at the time of the Battle of Adwa was Emperor Menelik II. Now, before him was Emperor Johannes IV. Now, Johannes IV had warned Menelik. When Menelik started talking to the Italians, he had warned him that, you know, these Italians have already occupied this part of Eritrea. And these are not people with whom to form a friendship. Okay. Because what they are after is taking over Ethiopia. We we'll lose our independence. Okay. If the, uh, 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 Emperor Yohannes died, uh, Menelik became uh, emperor. And he was responding to that, the attempt by the Italians to take over Ethiopia, to colonize Ethiopia. So the Battle of Adwa, <coughs> as I say, end of February 1896, is a battle to ensure the continued independence of Ethiopia that Ethiopia shall not be like all of these other countries which had become colonies uh, of the West. It's a, I do hope that there would be some book that all of us would be available here in this country for us to read about this. Because it's a fascinating story of, of leadership. Professor Muchi was saying that one of the problems that we have a curse or no have is this weakness of leadership on the continent. It's absolutely extraordinary to read about this. Because Menelik, for instance, uh, the Ethiopians had been fighting battles. They would fought battles against uh, the, the British, against the Egyptians, against Sudan, against the Italians. And, uh, so they were sensitive to this fact that to depend to, to, to defend the independence of, 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 of to guarantee the independence of Ethiopia, you had to deal with these possible interventions. And two matters were critically important. <clears throat> One of them was the unity of the Ethiopian people in defense of that independence. And I'm saying it's fascinating to look at this and to see what this emperors and, 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 and uh, feudal leaders, royal people did, very conscious about the need to maintain the cohesion and the unity of the Ethiopians about the matter of the independence of Ethiopia. For instance, as part of that, there was a, a schism uh, in the Ethiopian church, a theological schism, a division. Now, this is a very uh, Christian community for centuries. And the emperors understood, Johannes IV in particular understood, that if you allow this division in the church, it's bound to impact negatively on the unity of the population as a whole. So we need to deal with this. Now, at some point, so they, they, they tried, they sorted the matter out in terms of theology and all that, but uh, Emperor Johannes made a, a comment which uh, today makes you a bit. He said, one of the things that needs to be done, if there are any continuing heretics in the church, you must cut off their tongues so that they must stop talking nonsense to the people. Uh, but I'm saying this was uh, the idea of maintaining the unity of the Ethiopian people so that they can act in unity against uh, uh, any foreigner who wants to take away their independence. Uh, the second matter was they'd understood that uh, 
you had you needed to be properly equipped with weapons and so you have a very interesting situation in as, as they are quarreling with the uh, that's Ethiopian uh, uh, monarchy as they are quarreling with the Italians they were busy building very good relations with the French with the Russians the point that was made here by Professor Hobie about even in those early days uh, diplomats emissaries from the African continent interacting with the rest of the world the consequence of which was that the Ethiopians were able to arm themselves with modern weapons um, and that unity is very important because the, the war that the Ethiopians had to fight against the Italians had to be carried by the people as a whole. It's not a matter of uh, there's a professional army which must fight another professional army and the rest of the people is standing by. No. Because you've got uh, uh, the figure that's given is that uh, the Emperor Menelik had managed to mobilize the people who actually went and confronted the, the Italians at Adwa with something like 100,000 people. Who really literally it's an army that must live off the land. So the peasants must supply the food, uh, both for the people and for the animals, the horses and so on, and the donkeys that are carrying things. Um, so the whole nation is united behind this and they defeated the Italians at Adwa in 1896 I want to read you some things that were said um, from the white side about that uh, famous victory for instance uh, a report appears in the Times of London at that time uh, from their correspondent uh, in, in was in France and he wrote that no one here that is in Paris uh, I have not I have not to take notice of this or that this or that scatterbrained person but he says no one here wishes for the success of the Abyssinians at the price of the discomfiture of a civilized nation from which it is quite possible to differ in aims and opinions without being supposed to cherish any ill will when that nation is face to face with a brave but barbarous foe. Johannesburg Star, that's on the 5th of March, 1896, that's immediately after the defeat of the Italians. The Johannesburg Star said, the utter and crushing defeat represents the most disastrous check which any European power has received at the hands of the natives for years past. It cannot but be deplored by white men in all parts of Africa. It is far from impossible that this great defeat may have even larger consequences than a temporary check to civilization in Africa. At least the star then had some sense. Uh, uh, and the Cape Agas, uh, on the same day, uh, 5th of March, Cape Agas from Cape Town said uh, Italy is bound to carry out to the bitter end her policy in Abyssinia. Menelik must be crushed at any cost. And meanwhile Italy will have the keenest sympathy in her latest troubles. That was the view of white South Africa. His sympathy with Italy in her latest troubles. There's a, a George Barclay who wrote about this and said that uh, from the broader standpoint of politics and history, it seems possible that the Battle of Adwa heralds the rise of a new power in Africa, 
They were reminded that the natives of that continent may yet become a military factor worthy of our closest attention. And the suggestions, suggestion has even been made, upset as it appears at present, that this is the first revolt of the dark continent against domineering Europe. And the French historian spoke in London uh, on the 4th of March, and he said the defeat of the Italians by King Menelik is an, an event which you should keep in your memories. It is the waking up of Africa to meet what has been hitherto the disdainful seizure by Europeans of those countries which we call barbarous. It must not be forgotten that in many of these countries now reverted to barbarism, there formerly existed an extremely advanced civilization and that Ethiopia in particular enjoyed throughout Africa great renown for its refinement and wealth. Since then, it is true, he said, the isolation of tribes and peoples, the difficulties of communication and superstition, with all its attendant ills, have gradually brought about the decline of a portion of that region, the hidden riches of which are now so widely coveted. And the lecturer said the invasion of that country was too rapid, too precipitately undertaken. Everywhere Africans without distinctions have been treated as so many cattle to be branded with the owner's mark. The Italians have been not less courageous or less enterprising than others, but they made up their minds a little too late, and when they also went to Africa to get their share of the African fortune, the easily accessible regions had all been taken up so that they had to be satisfied with regions not open to the first comer. And he said the battle which has just taken place was a logical issue of events. From the moment that the Italians were in possession of Massawa and Kassala, the way should have that Massawa in Eritrea and Kassala now in, in Sudan, Eastern Sudan, the way should have been either to make a friendly alliance with the king or to crush him and obtain a solid foothold. But a mistake was committed. He was treated as a savage. It had not yet been understood that they had to deal not with barbarism, but with a dormant civilization now awakening and reappearing before the world. And just when the Italians flattered themselves that they had subdued the king, he was preparing to prove the contrary. His victory is that of all Africa. And this point of view will gradually become patent. In these countries, when news traverses the deserts as on the wings of the wind, you may be sure of the wind. You may be sure that some, that from one corner of Africa to the other, it is already known, or will be so tomorrow, that Africa has conquered Europe. And throughout those dusky myriads, there will be an awakening up to life and to an attitude of defense. This is the reason why this whole business is so serious and why nothing heedless than to rejoice at the defeat of the Italians. That defeat is also ours. It is a defeat of others. It is not that of civilization. This, as I've just told you, is a mistake but it is that of colonizing Europe, that of the Europe of tomorrow. This is a, a Frenchman giving a lecture in London, understood that the Italian victory, the, the Ethiopian victory at Adwa against Italians was an African victory. Uh, and says that beware, uh, you might look at Ethiopia rising, but in fact it's Africa rising. Let me t just show, tell you uh, in the Battle of Adwa was preceded by many other conflicts uh, with Italians. And uh, 
Uh, some of it took place in 1895, uh, October 1895. Uh, the general Baratieri, uh, Italian, who attacked Ethiopian troops and defeated them and occupied certain points which were later, during that offensive on Adwa, were taken back by the, uh, by the Ethiopians. This general Baratieri, having got his glorious victory, returned to Rome as 1895 and on his return he was hailed as a hero and received a standing ovation when he addressed the Italian Parliament and the Italian Prime Minister the Prime Minister of Italy at the time was a man called Francesco Crispi and uh, Prime Minister Crispi had described the Ethiopians that had been defeated by General Baratieri as I quote, barbarians whose material progress and spiritual salvation cries out for the high ministry of Roman civilization. And Baratieri, addressing the parliament, promised the Italian parliamentarians that he was going to bring Emperor Menelik, this barbarian, called him the barbarian, this barbarian Menelik, I'm going to bring him to Rome in a cage. A few months later, the Italian forces were defeated at Adwa. No Menelik was ever brought to Italy in a cage. And uh, the Italian left Africa in disgrace. That is Adwa. <coughs> uh, 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 Professor Mamomuchi talked about a book that uh, we thought we were going to write. As a colleague of mine, who's here, I don't know where he is now, uh, M. Kuan uh, I wanted to embarrass him. Oh, is it is down there? You know, we, uh, I'm about to finish with uh, the, um, <coughs> looking at this problem about how educated are we as Africans about ourselves and coming to the conclusion that we don't know ourselves, we don't know our history. Here is a major battle. Uh, that your, your, Europeans meet in, uh, in Berlin, uh, 1884, 1885, and decide to chop up the continent. 10, 11 years later, Ethiopians win at Adwa, which is in direct contradiction, in direct conflict with what Berlin had decided. Africa must be colonized. The Ethiopians said Africa will not be colonized and succeeded. And communicated therefore <laughs> and communicated therefore a message to all Africans that we can't. The fact that they met in Berlin and took this decision does not mean we must agree. And if we act, unite, as Ethiopians did, prepare ourselves as a, a fighting force as Ethiopians did and make sure that we can mobilize all the people to engage this, we will win. Now we, uh, <clears throat> we were saying to ourselves uh, with Mukon Rajtang that you know, not many of our people know this thing, this kind of history. Which is why young Kensani comes with their friends and says, all we know from what we're taught at school is that we're victims. We say, no, we're not victims, we're victors. Look at what happened at Adwa. He didn't know about that. So we are taught we should write a, a book. It really was inspired by the fact it was, a, well, long time ago now, more than 10 years ago that we took this decision, as, a, as <laughs> Professor Muchu was saying. To the year 2004, Haiti, Haiti celebrated 
uh, bicentenary, 200 years of the liberation of Haiti. Now, you remember what happened in Haiti last decade of the 18th century. The slaves rose and defeated the French. Now these are, the importance for us is that these are African slaves. And the ones who rose, 60% of the slaves who rose in Haiti were first generation Haitians. They had just been shipped over from Africa into Haiti. And so they had not forgotten that we were a free people, why are we here? And rose up against the French. They, just, they defeated three empires, those African slaves in Haiti. They defeated the British, they disbanded, uh, defeated Spain, and finally defeated France. Napoleon, you know Napoleon, he was making crazy statements saying that I'm going to go to that Haiti, I'm going to chop off all these epaulets on those things, and failed. So we were in Haiti, uh, January 2004, to celebrate the bicentenary of the liberation of Haiti by these African slaves. And we thought, you know, why don't we try and tell this story to our own people? An extraordinary struggle of slaves of Haiti, Africans, who fought and defeated three empires. You know the, I'm sure the, all of us, you know this state of Louisiana in America, the US. It's called Louisiana because it used to be French, named after King Louis of France. Uh, after their defeat, the French by Haiti, they sold that territory to the US, to the Americans. It's called the Louisiana Purchase. And the reason they did that is because the African slaves in Haiti destroyed the capacity of the French to take over Louisiana as their colony. Now, not many people know that. <clears throat> so we're saying that we need to tell the story of the liberation of Haiti and everything that went into that. That's the last decade of the 18th century. And then come to the last decade of the 19th century and tell the story of Adwa. And come to the last decade of the 20th century and tell the story of South Africa, 1994. That these things are linked. <coughs> uh, this is part of the same progress of the Africans towards liberation. Now, I'm saying that Mkoni is supposed to be writing one of the chapters. He's still writing it since uh, <coughs> since 2004. Uh, it'll be done one day. But in the end, I'm saying we are meeting on Africa Day to celebrate Africa Day. But I think one of the big challenges that we face as a continent is this mobilization of the African youth, raising their level of consciousness about ourselves raising the level of pride, sense of identity, so that indeed they should take on these things that uh, Professor Schobia was talking about. We as the African youth must take responsibility for the transformation of the continent. We are no longer victims. Adwa said, we are not victims, but we are victors. And so we can do this. And I think that's the importance of our celebration of Adwa today. But thanks a lot. <coughs>